343 describes in summary what will be elaborated later in the Gita. So we'll try to elaborate here to understand the practicality of the solution. Evam buddhe param buddhva samsthabhyatmanam atmana yahishatrum mahabaho kamarupam durasadam In the previous verse, Krishna gave outline and hierarchy. And he basically said the solution for combating lust is that we need to situate ourselves at the spiritual level. So if you consider the soul as the intelligence, as the mind, as the senses, And then outside the self, there are the sense objects. So now the soul proper is above all these. We consider this particular section, what is being said over here. It's quite interesting. So this is the conditioned self. The self who has the conditionings, and the conditionings are of of various impressions like lust. So what Krishna said is that with the intelligence, situate yourself on the spiritual platform. So when we are spiritually situated, we will have an upward pull, upward grip. And then the, the all three actually, is the mind, intelligence and senses, they are all partly contaminated by lust. And there is going to be a downward pull. So this is where the upward pull and the downward pull, this leads to the inner tug of war that is so often talked about in any literature about self-improvement or de-addiction or even our daily experience that there's a part of us which is, no, I, sh I don't want to do this. And the part is, I want to do it. And we just get pulled between those two parts. So this inner tug of war is going on between us. And if we can be spiritually situated, Krishna says, then we will be able to resist it. So today we'll be discussing what does being spiritually situated mean and how can one be spiritually situated? Specifically, how does being spiritually situated make it easier to win the war? Krishna says, Kama Rupa. This is a formidable enemy. It's not easy to conquer it. But you can by being spiritually situated. So, one way is primarily through knowledge. It's consistent and insistent concentration on knowledge. If there is repeated, consistent, and insistent. So, what does this mean? It's contemplation on the reality that I am a soul. This is the path of jnana. Here a person remembers that aham brahmasmi is a common saying within the Vedic tradition that I am spiritual, I am a spiritual being. I have got nothing to do with this man, material things. And these material things cannot give me any real pleasure because I am different from all of them. So, by repeated reiteration of this truth that I am spirit, a person can, at one level, give up material temptation. So, for example, at, at one level, this is like a person who is hooked to a, playing a video game, a person who is hooked to, uh, uh, say, watching TV or something like that, and then they think it's all false. Not false. I have no interest in this. I am different from all this. So, Aham Brahma me this idea that I am sister. I am spirit basically. 
I am spirit. And if I am spirit, that means material pleasure is alien to me. Material pleasure is superficial to me. It's not going to help me. It's uh, it's something separate from me. That it, it is it is just an act of imagination that it is just my misconception that I am thinking that this is giving me pleasure. So this is a time-honored way, although it's a difficult way. So the thing to understand, for example, is the example so there's a person and they have a they are wearing some clothes. Now if somebody, if that person is hungry and if food is given to the clothes, now, now some delicious mango juice or delicious dessert that is being put on the clothes, that's not going to give the person pleasure. But if you consider it from other perspective, when there's a little more imagination, if somebody If, say, somebody is a person and maybe there's their jacket or there is some cloth and somebody goes and hugs their jacket. Now, hugging the jacket is not the same as hugging the person. But what happens is, you think, hey, you know, oh, this person is expressing their love for the, the love for the other person. Yes, but that person is not there with it. So now when a person feels loud when the jacket is being hugged or that person remembers the other person, you know, that actual person is not there, but it's more in the mind, they're imagining, oh, oh, this person was there, this person was getting the jacket. And it's the memories that connect us with the person. Now, sometimes in certain situations, that, uh, that might be done, but it's hugging a jacket of a person is not the same at all as being with the person. So essentially, while the jacket is connected with the person, but the jacket is also different from the person. So if somebody hugs the jacket and doesn't even look at the person, and that would be very strange. If somebody is hugging the jacket in the absence of the person, that's okay. But if somebody hugs the jacket and neglects the person, then what are you doing? That would be the question. So like that, when we understand that I am, I am spirit, and then this is matter, the spirit is, so the body is matter. The senses are matter. And when I'm pandering to the senses, actually I am, I'm doing something, I'm doing things for something which is different from me. That, that doesn't give me pleasure. So when there is this rigid separation that is put between the, through our intellectual analysis, there's a rigid separation. That I am different from the body, that I am a spiritual being, then by understanding this, one can distance oneself from bodily pleasures and thereby end up not being captivated. Now, this is one way to conquer lust, but this is, or Krishna will later say, this is difficult. So becoming spiritually situated, Krishna says there is another way to do this. And that's what we will focus on. So now, Krishna talks about another way, which is what he will elaborate in the Bhagavad Gita of being spiritually situated. And this involves not just knowledge, knowledge is definitely part of it, but it is this redirection of one's entire being. So this is broadly the what is called the path of jnana. This leads to jnana yoga. But this redirection of one's entire being is what is called, what we can call as bhakti. Mm -hmm. Now what does this mean? Here the focus is not so much on that I am a soul, but that I am a part of Krishna. Krishna talks about this in later 15 points in the Bhagavad Gita, that I am a part of Krishna. That I am a part of the divine. So we use our intelligence to understand not just that I am a spiritual spirit different from matter and therefore I have nothing to do with matter. Rather, we understand that if I am a spirit, then 
इनसाइड मी देर इज द डिवाइन देर इज कृष्णा प्रेजेंट इन साइड आर हार्ट एज द सुपर सोल एंड देन द होल आइडिया बिकम्स दैट वी ऑफर अवर एंटायर बींग टू कृष्ण so that means within this particular to become spiritually situated how do we become spiritually situated one way is that okay i am the soul and i am not the body i just separate ourselves but another way is that we connect all aspects the soul is connected with krishna the intelligence is dedicated to krishna the mind is dedicated to krishna the senses are dedicated to krishna And the sense objects are also offered to Krishna, and this is the process of bhakti. So let me explain this: that this is another way to become spiritually situated. So this is the way which involves offering our entire being to Krishna. So we use our intelligence to glorify Krishna, to find new ways. to understand krishna's glories and to share and savor his glories then and we use our mind to remember krishna the mind is always thinking about something so we try to tell about krishna then we use our senses to perceive krishna that means we use our eyes to behold the form of krishna we use our ears to hear message of krishna We use our tongue to honor the food that has been offered to Krishna, and the sense objects. We offer in Krishna's service. So, for example, when we are eating food, rather than thinking that food is meant for my enjoyment, we understand this food is meant for Krishna's enjoyment, and that is the beginning step. So, when we, when all our Faculties are in this way connected with Krishna. Then bhakti becomes then it becomes much easier. So the higher connection is not solely dependent on the intelligence remembering. Oh, I am a soul different from the body. Rather, that higher connection is established through all aspects of our being, and in that way, this becomes much easier. it is not just easier it's also more natural because natural means we are not art we are not rupturing our being oh this body is different from me this body has got nothing to do with me so i don't care for my body i am the soul and the soul is meant to serve krishna or the i am a soul that's all but in the gyana marg krishna is not the focus also i am just a soul i am different from the body so i won't enjoy anything material but here it's something much bigger going on something much deeper much broader and in this process let's try to elaborate this a little bit further mm, so here now in the gita's progression right now krishna is talking about karma yoga and in karma yoga the focus is primarily on detachment from matter we are not matter and in that sense krishna is not talking about how to become spiritually situated krishna is focusing on how arjuna will do the right thing and for arjuna the right thing at that particular time was fighting of course he will fight in spiritual consciousness but now the spiritual how to be spiritually situated this will come later in the gita more elaborately we should talk about bhakti yoga this will be talked about in chapter especially in chapter 7 to 12 in the gita and then of course it will come later again in the 18th chapter especially towards the conclusion so there are different ways to try to be spiritually situated and here krishna's focus is on the principle not the specific so now there is a time for specific also so for example somebody may say that uh, a doctor may tell you know you got this tumor in your uh, near your heart 
Now, after we remove this tumor, then you can do this, this, and you'll be okay. Now, the doctor may be emphasizing remove the tumor. Okay. Or after we deal with the tumor. Now, how exactly is the tumor to be dealt with? What is the best way to deal with that tumor? There will be different ways. Now, do we remove it surgically? Do we try to give some chemical that dissolves the tumor and goes away by that way? Do we? What do we do? Uh, that may, there may be multiple strategies for that. So, Krishna is a focused teacher, and when he is when he is speaking to Arjuna of a particular subject, he focuses on that subject. Now, on the other hand, when we are studying here, we are seeing this section as a section talking about self-destructive desire. And if we are to overcome, if we are to be able to over, be able to overcome our sex, self-destructive desires, whatever they might be specifically for us, then this particular description can seem inadequate, become spiritually situated. But how do I do that? That within the flow of the Gita is going to be elaborated later. But what we are doing is to make this discussion more holistic. We are taking what is going to be discussed later in the Gita here. And now among these, the intelligence and the mind are things which Krishna will emphasize again and again in the Gita. That mind, arpita mano buddhi. Intelligence and mind, they are meant to be offered to Krishna. Because the senses at one level, will engage in their particular functions. Mm -hmm. The functions can be for Krishna, but the point is that the function of the senses is not going to change. Now, whether Arjuna heard the Bhagavad Gita or Arjuna didn't hear the Bhagavad Gita, he would be shooting arrows. He would be an archer. That would be his function. Uh, whether a person is spiritually conscious or a person is materially conscious, if the person says the surgeon, they are going to operate. If the person is a new singer, they are going to sing. So in one sense, the senses and their functions, they are going to remain unchanged. Now what is going to change is something different. It is that how are the, or rather why those senses are being engaged in that way. Can I do surgery? Why am I doing surgery? Am I just doing it to get money? Am I, am I going to do it to, in a mood of service to God? So that big change happens in the mind and the intelligence. This is the domain of inner change. Now to the extent our intelligence and mind are directed toward the spiritual level, they are directed towards the spiritual level in the sense that they are focused on, in this case, the highest spiritual reality, Krishna. To that extent, we will be spiritually situated. So being spiritually situated does not mean that Arjuna has to leave the battlefield and go to the Himalayas and sit in meditation. It means he becomes spiritually purposeful. And that spiritually purposeful means his mind and intelligence are immersed in, in service to the divine. And so, if we consider our intelligence and mind, they have the intelligence associated with our values. The mind is associated with our desires. Mm -hmm. That means that with our intelligence, you know, this is what is important for me. For example, uh, the mind may say, okay, you know, today, I just want to go and go to Disneyland and enjoy. I want to watch a movie. I just want to binge on movies. The intelligence will say, hey, you've got a job. You have a family to take care of. You have responsibilities. My value is that I, I, I'm a responsible worker. I take care of those who are dependent on me. So there can be this tension between the values and the desires. But in bhakti, what happens is we consider a spectrum where there could be tension at various levels. The person's values and desires are, say, both directed towards lust. That means that person is 
convince themselves that there's nothing wrong with enjoying. There's no more to life. Let's just enjoy. Who cares for anything else? Then that person is almost doomed over there. Now, for most people, what happens is their desires go in one direction, their values go in another direction. That means, now here I'm probably associating the intelligence with values and the mind with desires. Yeah, I know that I have to be sober to do this job. I know, but still, I got the urge to drink. And the tension did to go there. Now, here, the other side of this is Krishna, on this part. If we are at a situation where our desires are directed toward Krishna and our values are directed toward Krishna, then this is being spiritually situated. Mm -hmm. That means we not only with our intelligence understand that everything in this world is temporary except for Krishna and my relationship with Krishna, but along with that, our desires are also directed toward Krishna. Oh, there's nothing as wonderful as as loving Krishna, remembering Krishna, serving Krishna. And this is Sukhataram Aparam Najatu Jane. That there is no joy higher than the joy of remembering Krishna, of loving Krishna. So when we come to this level, so this is this is the level of the war. This is the space of victory. And this is the space of defeat. If both the values and the desires are directed towards lust, then we are already defeated, we are already conquered. When the desires and values are in opposite directions, then either this may win, that may win. It depends on which is strong. But once the values and desires both are directed towards Krishna, then Krishna says this way, Jahi Shatrum Mahaba, you will conquer over this enemy. Although this enemy is very difficult to conquer, Durasadam, you will conquer over it. And you will be victorious. Bhakti takes us along this path. By the path of Bhakti, it gives us philosophy to understand how Krishna is the ultimate reality. And it gives us practices by which we actually start experiencing the beauty and the sweetness of Krishna. And by that, gradually our desires get directed towards him. So I'll summarize. Thank you. So mainly we discussed two points here. The topic was being spiritually situated. And one was, so this was 343 text itself, one was through the path of jnana, where I am spirit. It is insistent, consistent contemplation on that to detach oneself from matter. And the other was the path of bhakti, where the focus is, I am a part of Krishna. And that means, my entire being, body, mind, and soul, everything, entire being is meant for service to Krishna. And in this path, it's much easier to get the higher taste and thereby overcome the self-destructive pull of calm, lust. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.